Hey everybody, Mark Shonagle here from Soft Damage, and uh, I'm going to be showing you today probably my last ever Soft Damage video for you guys. So what we're going to do today is a little shot reconstruction of this uh, this scene I'm scrubbing through right now. This is actually provided to me by my friends at Law For Me in Germany, and uh, this was actually for a commercial for Subaru called Car Parts, and I'm just going to play a little bit of it here. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, just search for uh, Subaru Car Parts, and uh, it's a really amazing commercial, all done with soft damage, lots of crazy ice work in here. And this is the shot right there, those uh, those dandelions basically made out of pistons, car pistons, uh, animating, kind of blowing in the wind. Okay, I'll play it again for you, so you can see they kind of start to wiggle right there, and then they all kind of blow away. So we're going to use that, we're going to use ice, we're going to use instant shapes, state machines, uh, we're gonna create some variables, all sorts of fun stuff. So, uh, again, here was the uh, here was the original version by Lot for Me, and you can see uh, basically we've got a couple different motions there. We've got a little bit of uh, kind of blowing in the breeze, and then they release and just kind of blow through each other, and then the camera move picks them going upwards like so. Uh, if I show you really quick the uh, the original ice graph and I'm not going to zoom in too deep so I want to show you all of their crazy work but you can see there's a lot of interesting ice nodes here uh, I'm actually going to recreate this for you in a much simpler fashion it's going to look pretty close won't be exactly the same uh, but as, po as opposed to writing all my own code here I'm going to use a lot of uh, kind of base level soft image nodes so why don't I just go ahead and fire up this other scene here where I've lightened it up a little bit and uh, there you can see we still have the the motion on there so we get that wiggling and then again, all the pistons sort of blow through one another. Uh, so let's go ahead and just uh, set up our viewport here a little bit. I'm gonna grab these um, the piston effect here, this point cloud. This is again, all particles. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and delete that one since we're gonna recreate it. And I'll also grab the background objects here and just hide them so we have a nice clean workspace and maybe go here to my user camera. So what we have here is uh, basically a sphere. It's not a real sphere. It's actually uh, was an icosahedron and basically a little 10-sided guy like that. And we just increased the, uh, the geodesic frequency here in the geometry creation node to get, uh, well, to get this kind of a sphere that has these nice, evenly spaced uh, vertices. Because essentially at every one of these vertices, we want to sprout a particle, which is going to grow our piston, and then we want to wiggle them and then release them. So I'm going to show you how we do all of that with ice. Now, if you're unfamiliar with ice, uh, I'm going to start out kind of going a little basic, and then we're going to dive into some, uh, some heavier stuff. For those of you that are familiar with ice and you want to skip ahead for the next couple of minutes, um, just, you know, really briefly, let me show you some of the presets, things you can do with ice. Um, so, for instance, just selecting our emitter right here, I'm going to click on my ice pull down, and I'll say something like uh, create, how about a basic fire? And this is just going to apply a preset, and you can see what happened here. We have a dialog box that popped up, and then these nodes appeared here in our ice graph. This area down here, this is our ice graph, our ice, and this is an ice tree. Um, and essentially, everything that appears in this dialog box are parameters in this node right there. So if I actually close this property page, double click here, you can see that property page comes back. And every parameter that you see here is actually a parameter in this property page. Size, directional factor, space frequency, size, directional factor, uh, space frequency. Uh, there you go. So all of these parameters here are driven by these uh, inputs right there. So I could go and hit play right there. Uh, or simulate rather, because this is a simulation, and we can see we've got some fire. And now I can start to tune these sliders there, increase the size, decrease the size of those particles. Uh, if we play with like the Perlin factor, you can see we get some different types of noise. Uh, and all of this is actually driven by this code right there. All that code gets packaged up, turned into what's called a compound, which this gives the artist just a few parameters that they can tune. Uh, if we go ahead and delete that, let's actually delete this, there we go. Select our emitter again, Maybe we'll do one here. Uh, let's do bubbles. Just another preset. Again, we get a nice little UI. Press simulate. There we get our bubbles, and I can increase the size, decrease the size. And all we've really given our artist here, again, is the ability to, to tune the common parameters that we want to use. The technical director would set up this tool, and the artist would go ahead and uh, use it. Or, you know, maybe you're, you're skilled enough to where you're creating your own tools uh, and packaging them up yourself. Either way, it's just an awesome way to, uh, to collapse your work and make it all nice and user-friendly. Uh, the last little preset I'll show you is just a different type of, uh, I guess you call it geometry, and that's going to be strands. So I'll click on uh, dynamic strands here, and now let's go and just branch select our, um, sorry, there we go, branch select our entire uh, piston there, our stem. And now if I grab this and move it all around, you can see we have some cool strands going on there. Double click this guy here, increase my strand count to maybe 500, 
And as soon as it recycles, now I've got quite a bit more strands. And this all behaves with dynamics, and you can have this run into objects. Uh, you can make some very cool hair using the strand system. But, uh, but we want to make pistons. So let's go ahead and delete that. Let's just stop our simulation. And uh, let's go and just delete our strands, delete our particle cloud, and let's go ahead and start from, uh, from scratch here. So again, we want to basically make it so that each one of these points emits some particles. So I'll just start off with a basic emission. So we'll say ice, create basic emission, and there we go. Uh, so now we're emitting a few particles, uh, 400 to be exact. Now I must say, and I kind of use this disclaimer with all my videos, uh, the software that I'm using to record this really, really crushes performance. Um, this was normally about four or five times faster. I'm on a uh, quad core laptop, so nothing crazy. And again, ICE is fully multi-threaded, so the more cores you have, the more CPUs, etc., the faster it'll be. However, when you run screen capturing software, it just destroys performance. So anyway, this would be quite a bit faster. But anyway, let's just uh, change this to like 4,000 or even 40,000, and you can see it's still very fast even with the, uh, the software running. So anyway, let's bump this back down to 400. And uh, let's tune some of these parameters. But first, let's go and just organize our work a little bit. I'm going to expand all my different nodes. And this basically was created when I did the uh, ice basic emission. So I could have built this all from scratch. But generally, when you're working with particles, you're going to set this up anyway. So I just like to use the, uh, the basic emission and work from there. So again, what we wanted to do was get uh, particles to emit from each one of these vertices. So let's do a little bit of setup here. And uh, before we actually tune our particle emitter, First, let's change this to, how about cylinders? So now I can see these a little bit better. And uh, maybe I'll increase the size of those cylinders like so. Now I can see them see them uh, quite a bit better like so. Now, as I move this slider here, you can see that the, the values change and I'm getting new size particles every time it refreshes at frame one. Well, what if I want these particles to be random? Uh, random size, a couple easy ways to do that. Uh, pay attention here that the word size is there. And what I'm gonna do here is say ice, uh, after emission, you can see I have all these different parameters. I can align them to things, roll them, spin them, stick them. Um, before they're emitted or on their emission, I can say, you know, randomize their size, their color, whatever. Let's do a randomize on their size. And what that did is it plugged the randomize around value node into the size input. And now if we go back to our emit from geometry node, you'll notice that the size parameter is gone. If I unplug that, size comes back, plug this in, size goes away. So now size, every single ver every single particle is getting a new size value as opposed to a singular value when I use the slider. So this is how you can control multiple objects at once or multiple particles, give them uh, multiple parameters by using these different nodes. Now, if we double click on this, uh, I can change the size of these particles like so, make them bigger, make them smaller. Uh, I could check the animate button, which was actually ch checked already, but you can see it's not doing anything. Uh, the reason that it's not animating is because one of the really important concepts with ICE is the, the concept of executing on a mission or executing every frame. So here we're telling it only on the initial value. So only when these particles are born am I setting the age value. So this animated value isn't being passed along because it's only asking for what size are you at frame one. If I want them to change frames or change uh, size every frame, I'm going to have to do that a little bit differently. So I'm going to go here and just say set particle and we will get the set particle size node. And you can see this has an execute output. Whereas this plugs in with a green line, green lines are scalar values, uh, into the size parameter. So this I'm going to plug into here, which is going to execute every single frame. And now I can change this value. And you can see that right away, I see the change of my particle size. Because again, that's being executed every single frame. Now if I plug this into here, now we get something crazy. Now we're getting... All of these randomized values animated. Uncheck animate, and we have it the way it was before. Check animated, and we have something that gets you a little bit dizzy. Uh, if I go here and get some turbulence, let's get turbulence around value, and let's plug that guy into size. And now you can see we got kind of a pulsing action, and a lot of these particles are being uh, generated with a negative size value, so they're coming out black. So let's just increase the base value to a little over one, a variance of one, and you can see we have that. now. I'm not quite sure exactly what this is going to do for our demo, so let's go ahead and just zoom out a bit. Uh, what I did really want to show you is just more importantly the order of execution, whether you're doing something every frame uh, or if you're doing something uh, you know, just at emission time. So let's go ahead and just delete this, delete this, and delete that. Uh, we'll get back to some of those concepts in a bit. But let's go ahead and further finish tuning our actual particle emitter. Now I'm going to uh, just go here to frame one and show you a neat little trick. 
Uh, when you're at the very first frame of your simulation, you can start to adjust your parameters and see them update without the object actually moving. Now, oftentimes you'll see me work uh, with the simulation just playing in loop mode, which is great, but sometimes you want to just see stuff right at the beginning, how they're born, kind of get some information like that. So I'm just going to pause this at frame one, and I'm going to increase this, say, to, say, 800 particles or so, and that doesn't quite look like 800 particles. Uh, so let's do this. Let's change this to, uh, okay, total part, total number of particles or total number of particles per second. I'm going to do total number. So there we go. So now we're seeing 800, and they're all being generated randomly over the surface. Well, I want them to generate out of each vertice. So I'm going to switch that to point, and I'll pin this open using that little lock icon. You can pin these uh, property pages. And you can see that I'm not getting nearly as many particles on the vertices as I'd like. Now, I'm told it to be 781 particles, but there's clearly not 781 particles there. So I couldn't actually figure out how to get that to work. So I actually opened up the manual. So I clicked on the little help icon, and that brought up the online help. I did a search, and uh, I typed in setting up basic emission. And that brought all of this stuff up here. And it was here under setting up any type of particle emission. I started to read a bit and I saw, okay, well, yeah, that's what I'm getting here. And that's what I want. So it just told me to do this right here. It says, uh, open up the emit from geometry compound for editing and then enter the generate points compound, uh, enter the generally sample, blah, 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 blah. So I read all this and what it tells you to do is enter the emit from geometry compound. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means click on this little E button. So just like I showed you before, this is kind of how it's wired up behind the scenes. And don't worry, this is a little intimidating now, but by the end of the demo, this will all feel comfortable, hopefully. Um, so inside here, we have some other nodes, and it said, then dive further into the generate sample or the generate points node, or compound rather. So go in there. And there's a node here called generate sample set. And the instructions say, go into here and change this to uh, all points. And there you go. Now we get exactly what we were looking for. So what we really did there is we almost kind of sort of modified the source code. Uh, the beauty of ICE is that, you know, not only is it multi-threaded, not only is it very open, but uh, it allows you to, to, to change the, the nodes that we've created. Uh, if you want to see how the initialized force velocity node works, well, there's the parameters for it. Uh, and it's pretty much like that for all the nodes. Of course, there's an SDK where you can create your own nodes. Um, but, you know, again, pretty much everything you need is in here. And you can always go ahead and rewire something like we did here. Uh, so anyway, that got us uh, fairly close to the way we want our emitter to look. We don't want them to all to fly out like that. So I'm just going to double click this guy here, change the speed to zero. And now you can see we've got all of our particles, at least uh, they kind of look right. You know, we got to get them to face the correct, correct direction. There's still a bunch of other work to do. Uh, well, let's at least get them to stick to the, uh, to the, to the emitter there so they don't just you know, kind of stay there in space. So what I can do here is just go ice and we can say on a mission uh, or after a mission rather, I want to stick to location and they're just going to stick. And what that did is it added the stick to location node and it's telling it to execute every frame. So it's just going to stick to whatever emitted it. Uh, now I need to get them to be orientated correctly because right now they're all pointing straight up. So I saw that there was an align in here. So after a mission, uh, line to velocity, no, line to camera, no. Shoot, that's all the align stuff. Well, what if I go down here into my node bin and type in align? Ah, look, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, well, if I backspace over that real quick, what you can see here are all the different nodes that ICE had. Some of these are compounds, which means you can dive into them like this. Uh, and then some of them are base nodes. And you can tell by the icon, if there's like a little bucket with three gears, that's a compound, a single node, which you cannot go into, a uh, base level node. That's just a little simple gear icon. Um, oops, didn't mean to do that. Let's delete those guys instead. There we go. And uh, so again, what I want to do here is type the word align, and we will get align to position. Is that what we want? Align to surface? Align to surface. That sounds right. So let's get align to surface. And we will plug this in to here. Let me just reorder that just for aesthetics. doesn't really affect anything. Uh, and you can see everything turn red because it doesn't know what particle surface to align to. Now, when I set up at the very, very beginning of the demo, I set up uh, the basic emission. I had the uh, the sphere selected. Well, that's the, the nodal representation for the sphere. If I were to stop this really quick and we were to hide our emitter, uh, I could grab the sphere, press F3, drag it in. And it's basically the exact same thing. These nodes here are identical. Uh, I could also just go up here and grab the emitter uh, and pull it in like so. That works as well, except I didn't have the emitter selected. There we go. So you can grab it off an explorer. Uh, you can press F3 and get a floating explorer. But whatever, essentially I just need to plug something 
into the surface so it knows what particle or what surface to align to. Uh, because these are both the same, watch, a neat little trick is to just use the same node. That's exactly the same because, again, this node represents this sphere here. Uh, if we unhide our point cloud, press simulate, there you can see we have that. Now, it's a bit wonky right now. Uh, if I go into my align particle to surface, I just need to change this to align to the surface normal. And now we get something that looks like that, which, hey, that's pretty good. We're uh, that's almost a dandelion. Um, so let's do this. Instead of, uh, instead of let's... Uh, finishing building the effect, let's take a little break from, from kind of the, the effect side of thing. And let's just tune a couple more parameters on our emitter, show you how we can work with some weight maps uh, and some other things like that. So right now, if we look underneath here, you can see that we're going to emit pistons, you know, pointing straight down into the stem. And that's not really quite how, well, most, most dandelions don't have car parts hanging out of them. But, you know, dandelions generally don't grow straight downwards like that. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll hide our particle cloud. So let's just select it, press H, select the sphere. Now what I could do is select a bunch of polygons like I'm doing here, press the delete key, and then we wouldn't have any polygon or any uh, particles being emitted from those vertices. But another thing we can do is to use a weight map. So I'll go property, weight map. You can also find the same tool here under property in the pull down. Either way, uh, I'm going to do a weight map, and that will put a map on top of here, a parameter map. And if I change the base weight to 100, you can see that basically it's a value between 0 and 100 that allows me to affect different parameters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the underneath black. And you can see that Softimage is smart enough to hide the uh, geometry that was in my way as I was painting. And so that area is now uh, painted with a weight map. And I can come over here to my node bin now and type in filter by weight map and just plug this in to here. And if we unhide our uh, geometry, check it out. Now, where I painted the weight map is no longer going to have any dandelions. And if I go and just start painting, even though I'm middle of the simulation, look, I can go and paint out those dandelions. And the reason for that is because I'm plugged into execute on a mission and I'm having it execute every frame. So, you know, you'll notice they won't grow when, uh, when I paint, but they will disappear. And that's because they're only spawned on a mission, but they can be deleted at any time. And again, that's because every frame I'm checking to filter by the weight map. Best practice for this though, since we're only gonna do this once on a mission, is to plug it in here. So it's only gonna do that weight map filter when, uh, when I emit them. And now you can see if I remove some, they don't actually disappear until it gets to the end of the frame and recycles the, uh, the simulation. So there you go, okay. So that's pretty good. Uh, I can see we're fairly happy with that. Let's go ahead and hide that emitter. And now let's replace these, uh, these cylinders with some actual geometry. So let's type in the word instance, instance, and we'll get instant shape. We'll plug the shape node into the corresponding shape input there. Double click here, and now it's asking me for a shape. And you can see that everything went away because it's no longer the cylinder parameter is now being overridden by nothing. So let's just go into explore. Uh, I've got this thing here called piston shaded. And as soon as we get back to frame one, bonk, there we go. Check it out. We've got all of our pistons now attached onto our, uh, onto our dandelion like so. And maybe now what we'll do is just increase the size of these guys just a hair to like 0.7. If we go here to frame one, you can see they'll increase. And look, I can do that just like that. See, so again, nice just to park your timeline there at frame one and, uh, and go from there. All right. So we've kind of tuned our emitter now. Um, everything looks good. The, the particles are on there, right? They're pistons. Uh, now we need to get them to wiggle in the breeze. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so right now, uh, the align particle to surface node is what's essentially aligning all these particles to face the way they are. Uh, if I were to disconnect that, you can see all the particles then lines, align straight upwards. So somewhere in here, we're getting the math to adjust those orientations. So I'm just going to go and pull this guy down like this. Let's dive into this compound, and let's take a look at what we have here. So a bunch of little lines, a bunch of different colors, uh, some interesting stuff to point out if you're unfamiliar with ice. Uh, these color-coded lines are very important. They represent different data types. So, for instance, a baby blue line is, uh, is an orientation, so a vector and an angle. Uh, yellows are just vectors. Greens are scalar values. Uh, and orange is a condition or a Boolean and a yes-no, essentially. Um, so what this code here is doing is it's essentially taking a couple vectors, a couple angles, uh, and it's turning that into an orientation for these pistons or these particles. Uh, that is then packaged up into the align particle to surface node. 
outputting from this is an execute node. And that execute node is specifically saying that after you do all of this math, take this orientation value and set the particle's orientation with it. Because this could be the orientation value for anything. But this right here specifically says, OK, now this orientation is, is specifically going to be the particle's orientation. Uh, well, I want to use that data, but I don't want to use it as an execute. I just want to actually use the variable. So I'm going to pipe this variable to the outside. And now look, now I've got the result here. So this node is now going to output two things. One, it's going to output an execute node that says set the particle that you're attached to. So this particle here is set their orientation. And this is just going to be an orientation value that I can do anything with. It's just I could set the orientation of a sphere, you know, way over here or set something completely different off of this object. Uh, it's just at that point a parameter. So I'm going to declare a variable from this. Uh, before I do that, this is completely not important as far as the or as far as functionality, but you can rename any of these ports. So if you don't want this to be called result, I could say uh, this is the orientation output or whatever. Uh, there you go. And so you can see now I've got a really long descriptive name there. Uh, well, I want to set a variable. I want to take this output and actually load a variable with it. So I'll do a set data. And this is essentially how you set a parameter, set a custom parameter or variable, whatever you want to call it. And I'm going to pipe the output of that into here. And I will pipe the execute node into here so that every frame we're going to set that variable or update it. Now, what do I want this variable to be called? Well, I want it to live on the point cloud. I know that. And you can see everything turns red because I haven't given it a name. And I'm going to call this, um, well, here, before I call it anything, check this out. If we go into the point clouds um, geometry node here, you can see all of the custom parameters, all of, I guess these aren't the custom parameters. These are the parameters that are system parameters. So every uh, point cloud is going to have all of these parameters stuck to it. Well, I want to create my own, my own variable, my own parameter in there. So I'm going to, on the object called point cloud, I'm going to create a variable called ms. I like to use my initials to start. Uh, we'll just say ms piston orient, like so. If I can type, there we go. So I've just declared a variable. And now if I go back into my list of variables, we should see, there it is, ms piston orientation. And so every single frame, we're going to take the orientation for every one of these particles and load this variable up with it. I'm not doing anything with it yet, but I'm basically setting up my framework or setting up my uh, my tree here to be able to access that node later. So I want to just get it now. Uh, so let's do a get data. So I want to get data and I want to set some data, set data like so. Now the get data, the data that I want to get is living on the point cloud and it is actually called MS piston orientation. And I should actually point this out. Right now I'm using the name point cloud, point cloud. What's really best practice is to, oops, sorry. What's really best practice is to not actually use the object name because what happens if I create another point cloud? That's going to be called point cloud one, and then this tool isn't going to work if I copy and paste it. Uh, if you type the word self, that's much better. It means itself or whatever this tree is attached to. It's going to do. It's going to load that variable. So essentially, it's the exact same thing. It's just better practice again to use uh, self in this case because I want to make this code portable which I will do here at the end of the demo. We'll make a few copies of these. Uh, so now I'm going to get the orientation of the piston, and I'm going to load this variable. And what is that variable going to be, or what do I want to set? Well, now I want to set, and this isn't going to make any sense at all at first, I want to set the orientation of the particle to that, which it's already set to. So here, let's plug this in, and we can make fun of how this doesn't make any sense. So what I'm doing here is I'm getting the orientation of the piston as a variable, I'm creating a variable called Mark's piston, and I'm loading that variable. Then I'm getting that variable again, and I'm piping it through the point clouds orientation, which this is already setting. Because remember, right here, we're setting the orientation to that. So these two nodes are doing the exact same thing. So if I hit simulate or play, it's not going to change it one bit. It's going to run a tiny bit slower probably, but you know, because we're being redundant. But what I can now do is intercept that math, that data, and modify it. So now if I go into this add node as I intercept that orientation value, if I move the scalar slider, check that out. I get this weird kind of behavior as I'm adjusting the uh, orientation of each particle. And I can change the uh, the vector on that by adjusting that to a 0 or a 1. And now you can see I'll spin those around the y-axis like so. So with this little bit of code, I've essentially gained control of all of my particle's orientation or my piston orientation. And now I want to basically put a little bit of turbulence on that. So let's go ahead and get the turbulence node like we did before, turbulence around value. 
and I'll just plug this into, shoot, where am I gonna plug it into? Well, this doesn't work. All right, why doesn't this work? Well, turbulence is outputting a green dot, which is a scalar value. Now it could also change into vector math. This is actually legal. The, uh, the, the turbulence around value will actually automatically change. And I'll show you that a little bit later in the demo. But it can't change to an orientation because orientation is X, Y, Z plus an angle. And this is really just outputting scalar or vector math. It doesn't really understand angles. So what I'll do to change that or to be able to still work with this, I'm gonna get a multiply by scalar slider or a node, which is basically a great way of putting a slider into somewhere. Uh, and these have automatic data typing, which means they're black nodes, which means they will basically turn into whatever you plug into it. So I plug a blue node in, it turns blue. So I'm gonna multiply it by itself, which will give me this slider here, which I can do that with. But now if I take turbulence and pipe that into there, now check it out. Now we've got a little bit of turbulence, actually a lot of turbulence on all of those uh, pistons. And we're starting to get something like a ridiculously extreme dandelion. Uh, so let's go ahead and just tune this up a little bit. Maybe uh, change the turbulence scale, you know, drop this way down, something like so. That's actually way too much. Oh, I meant, sorry, I meant variance. Well, I actually want to cre increase the turbulence scale, but just crank our variance down so it's a little bit subtle. Uh, and right now we're running at full um, every frame, so it's going a little bit faster than normal. So if I go and change this into RT mode, this is going to actually play it back at 24 or 30 frames a second, whatever the project was done at. And you can see it's a lot more slower, you know, a lot more realistic looking as it's kind of waffling in the breeze. Uh, check the animated parameter, and that'll actually make it look like it's moving through the air. So with turbulence, when you turn animated on it, it animates kind of the air around it as well as the values, kind of one way of, of looking at it. And I'm actually going to increase this just a bit more to 15. And now you can see we've got our nice little uh, wafting in the air, which is pretty cool. So uh, shoot, we're getting there. All we need to do now is release them. Uh, before we do that though, let's go ahead and do a couple other little uh, cool little ice tricks here. So the first one I'll do here is just grab all of these nodes, right click and say, create compound and check that out. I just took all of those nodes and collapsed them. Uh, I should point out if I, let's do this, let's select this compound again, compound, explode compound. So you can always kind of, you know, blow up your compound after you've created it, if you don't want it to be that way. Uh, I should point out that I didn't have to do this whole creating of a variable. I could have actually just taken this output and plugged it into there, would have done the same thing, but I just wanted to show you how you create a variable or a custom parameter, whatever you'd like to call it. And that also lets me then easily create this compound. So a couple different ways of doing what I just did. Uh, we're gonna create this compound here. Let's dive into it. Let's call it uh, Wiggler and let's expose a parameter. So I want the artist to be able to choose, uh, tune say the base value. And if we go up, look, there's Wiggler, there's a base value, double click that. And we've got one port now where I can change the, uh, the crazy base value for our, our turbulence. Uh, and if we go in here, I can expose more parameters and notice that as I expose the parameter, this dialog box automatically updates. And depending on what color the data is, that changes the type of data type that you see here in this, uh, in our tool here, in our property page. So, you know, again, even ones as complex or as colorful or whatever as this one here, where we have all sorts of different data types. Those are just these parameters exposed, which you do right here, just like I just did a second ago. So again, all those colored lines, all you're doing is exposing parameters. Uh, once you get used to that, geez, it makes total sense. Allows you to create little small widgets, little tools like that. And there you go. Um, so now that we've created a tool, I wanna show you a couple uh, little visual debugging tools, things that can kind of help your work out as you're, uh, as you're creating this. So what I'm gonna do is stop the simulation. Let's go to frame zero, frame one. Gonna turn off loop. And I'm gonna click this little icon right up here, this little stopwatch. And what this will do is let me do some, basically some benchmarking, some performance diagnostics. So with that guy selected or, or turned on, just press play or simulate. And I'm just gonna let this run through one time and let it get to the end here. Cool, so that's gonna stop automatically. And now look, I can change this from no highlight to show me the time it took to execute all threads. Zoom in a bit and look at that. I can see in the number of milliseconds how long it took each one of these tools to execute. And that's where I found this kind of peculiar bit of information. Look at that, the stick to location node is taking 811 milliseconds to execute where everything else is taking like 10. Well, this one here, okay, align to surface is 333, but geez, what the heck is going on with stick to location? So that's why I decided to go in there and go, oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So the stick to location node does a lot of stuff. And actually, if you dive into it, there's a couple different pull downs here. 
So it's trying to do a lot of things, and I really only need them to just basically stick to where they're at. So watch this. We'll just do a, a simple little make our own node. How's that? We'll go do a uh, get particle emit location since I want them to stick to their emit location. And look, that outputs a position and a normal. Awesome. Uh, and then I want to set the particle position like so. So I'm going to say, all right, get the emit locations position, pipe that into the particles position, and let's just put that in here. And that's going to do exactly the same thing. Only now, let's actually create a compound. Right click, create compound. Uh, we'll put this here. We can always, of course, name this. We'll call this uh, sticky LT. Go up, turn on our performance monitor, press simulate on frame one. We've got our clock running there. Gets to the end. Let's see how long it took to execute. Check that out, 39 milliseconds. So we've just shaved off, what, 800 milliseconds per frame. So, you know, with a little bit of uh, work, you can definitely diagnose your, uh, or benchmark or performance test your scenes, your ice graphs, uh, and also make your own tools that you can see, you know, how fast is that? You can find bottlenecks, obviously, easy this way. So some really cool stuff in there for, uh, for performance tuning and uh, just getting an overall idea of how long it takes your scenes to execute. Uh, all right, cool. So shoot, we've done a lot. We've got our we've got our things wiggling. We've created our new sticky tool. We've got our wiggler tool set up. Uh, now really all we need to do is make these guys release and blow away. So to do that, we're going to use a state machine. Uh, state machines are great. Essentially what a state machine does is say, okay, well, I'm in this particular state. I'm doing something. So in this case, we're wiggling. And then some sort of a trigger is going to come along and it's going to make me change state. So in this case, we have a sphere that I had hidden, uh, and this is gonna be the trigger sphere. And I'm gonna say, okay, if any particle falls within that sphere or any piston, I want you to change states and inherit some dynamics and essentially release from the emitter. So again, I mentioned we're gonna do states. Uh, inside of our simulation root node here, if you double click that, we have a built-in state machine. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on states. Uh, I'm gonna pin this down and go to wireframe really quick. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want you to see this, I, this guy right here, set particle color to state color. As soon as I click that, it's going to change color to whatever state that I'm in. So here, let's just make this, keep that like baby blue, whatever. And now we'll add a second state. So we'll just type the word state over here. And where is it at? Down here at the bottom, grab state. I'm gonna plug that into here. And now let's just set up our two different states. So in state one, it's this baby bluish state. Uh, I'm going to call that state ID zero. When the trigger happens, when the sphere comes along, we're going to move to state one. This state here, I'm going to double click on. We'll say, all right, well, you're state one and you're going to be dark blue. So we'll just keep that the way it is and set your particle color so I know when you're in that state. Okay, it doesn't go into state two yet. We don't see these guys turn dark blue. And the reason for that is I haven't set up a trigger yet. So I'll type the word test over here to my left in the node bin. And you can see we have all these different testers. Uh, testers return conditions or orange for the most part turn uh, return conditions or yes then booleans whatever you want to call them uh, true false so what I'm going to do is get a uh, test if it's inside geometry and you can see it's just asking me for a geometry so I'll plug that into trigger I'll press F3 to get a floating explorer grab the trigger sphere drop it in there this node here now represents that animated sphere plug this into there and just that easily whoop as that sphere gets uh, over top of them, they turn dark blue. And you can see then they stop moving. All the animation goes away because essentially they've got nothing to do. They're, they've been released from that state and they have no idea what to do next. So now I have this blank state as essentially a whole new scene. So before everything was being generated with this code here, now I've got basically a blank canvas to tell these, these particles to do whatever I want them to do once they get in contact with that, uh, or, uh, that trigger sphere. Well, the first thing we'll wanna do is add a force. So let's just say add force, and I'll tell this to execute on trigger. Nope, because that'll only make it do it once. We'll say execute every frame. And now we will have still nothing, because I haven't told it what force to give it. So we'll type in forces, and you can see we have wind, drag, coagulate, all sorts of stuff. Uh, where is wind? Down here a bit. There it is. Let's grab our wind force, plug this in, and give it a little bit of wind, maybe a little bit of upwind as well, so maybe like 0.5. And I can see they're moving to the left or to the right and also moving upwards or moving in X and Y, I guess I should say. And maybe now we'll go back into uh, shaded view again 
and now you can get a better idea of how that's moving. So clearly we have a bit of work to still to do, but we got our wind going on there. Uh, let's get some turbulence. Turbulize around value, and we'll plug this in. Now notice what's going on here. If I double click this, all of these are scalar math right now. So zero, one, and five, green dot, green dot going to yellow dot. Watch what happens right here when I do that. Plug that in, boink, all of that just changed to vector math. So a lot of these nodes do what we call automatic data typing, which is, again, you plug a node in and uh, it automatically converts all of its math into that type of uh, that type of data. So now we've got this little business going on. I'm gonna increase a little bit of Y motion there just to get those guys moving upwards a bit more. And now you can see we start to get a little bit of tumble. Actually, that's made a little bit too much in Y. Make those guys stick around a little bit longer. Uh, and let's make them kind of explode outwards a little bit. So I'm gonna do a uh, get particle emit location, this guy right there. And the beauty of this node is it outputs a normal value. So it's gonna output the direction of every particle that was facing when it was emitted. So if I plug that into here, let's just unplug these just to give you an idea of what it looks like. What it's gonna do is just shoot them off in the direction that they were created. Um, I can go get a multiply by scalar slider, drop that right on top of it so it hooks up like so. And if I double click this now, I can increase or decrease that effect however I want it. I'll say just a little bit below, maybe like 0.7, just so it's not quite so crazy. There, plug all these three back in. And we're starting to get something similar to what we had. So they wiggle and then they just kind of flow around. Now they're not really doing a whole lot. I should, I noticed this isn't connected. Let's plug this guy back in, made a little mistake there. There we go. So now we've got our wind, we've got our tumbling, well, our, our turbulence, and we've got our uh, that kind of explosion. But let's actually go ahead and make them tumble. So I'll use the spin particle node, and this has an execute output. So we'll just plug this into execute every frame, and we'll do that, and boy, do they start spinning. So that's cool. <laughs> Maybe that's a little bit too much. So we can keyframe this stuff. So check this out. We'll go here to say frame zero. We don't need them spinning until right about here at frame 30. So we'll set the spin rate at say 0.2, right when they start off. And then after over time, say it's like, I don't know, frame 75, we'll make this 0.5 and set that keyframe. If I right click on that little red tick, I can go into my animation editor. I can see that keyframe, zoom out. I can grab that point, move it, change the timing if I want, very easy. Uh, and this little icon right there, anytime you see a green dot, and these are all over soft image, that means you can keyframe it, drive it by an expression, a constraint, um, the mixer, all sorts of different ways of driving animation. And then it shows you this little squiggle, which means that it's being driven by a keyframe. So let's go ahead and play this back and see what happens. So they release, they start tumbling. Cool, all right, we're getting there, starting, starting to take shape. Uh, let's get another spin particle. If you remember from the video, they start actually spinning on their local y-axis and they get faster and faster and faster as they move about. So let's go ahead and plug that into here. And right now they're still tumbling. So I'm gonna tell them to spin on their local y-axis. And watch this, I can make them just spin like crazy. And that's just, you know, obviously doing that live in the viewport, just grabbing this slider. But we don't want them that much. We do want some spin. So let's just say here at frame 55, we got no spin. And then all the way up there at frame 150, we've got like three spin. Go back to frame one. And you know, those values, just put them in there, see how they look, open up the animation editor, tweak them a bit more. They're definitely spinning right now. But the last thing that they were doing in the video is they all slowly started to orientate their way upwards. Right now, they're just kind of spinning aimlessly after they get released. So let's go ahead and get one more node here. We'll get a line and I want to align to a surface and I'm sorry, align to a position. Let's grab a line to position and plug this into here. And right now they're instantly all aligned 100% downward because this guy's strength is set to one. Uh, so that's why they're all immediately doing it because it's taking full control. Uh, and also the, the local vector is positive one Y, which seems right, but it's actually negative one Y that we need will make them face the correct direction. So you can see at negative one, they're actually facing upward. So what I'll do here is just slowly keyframe them as well. So they get released. And then just like I'll do here, I'll just have them slowly move upwards. So let's go here to say frame right about there we want it to start, say frame 85. Let's put our weight keyframe at zero. 
And then maybe here at frame 140, let's keyframe this to like 0.4. It's a really subtle effect to get that spin. Go back to frame one. We swoop, release, they tumble, they start to orientate upwards, and then they start to spin. So shoot, that's actually looking pretty close to what we had. Uh, maybe I'll show you one more node, coagulate. Uh, force coagulate, this guy here. Uh, the coagulate force, if you know what coagulation does, it kind of makes things basically stick together uh, as they get near one another. So instead of having them attract one another, because we have an attraction strength, we have a curve and a distance, I'm gonna make them repel one another. So I'll say, all right, well, your cutoff distance is four and your attraction strength is negative one. And what that'll do is it'll essentially make it so that these guys won't collide with one another. It doesn't do dynamics. I could throw rigid body dynamics on here. I'd have a lot less control, but what that'll basically do is just make it so that they repel one another and don't basically touch. Uh, and I wanna change a couple other things. Now I'm using as a tester, I'm using that test inside geometry. Here's another one. Uh, if we do a test distance to surface, it looks a little bit better. It's a little bit more organic, I guess you could say. So let's just go ahead and replace that. And you can see it's not quite as, let's play this back from the beginning. It's a little more organic the way they they fly away. And maybe I could increase the strength a little bit so they, you know, more of them fly away. But anyway, it looks, looks cool that way, I think. This kind of leaves a few of them stuck on there. We could bring it back to what it was either way. Um, and shoot, what else do we want to do with this guy? I guess that's kind of it. Maybe we'll hide our hide our uh, our trigger sphere there, and let's go back to our original shot camera, and let's just see what it looks like with those hand animated pistons up front, because you can see we've got a few little hand animated guys. So those guys fly away, and then those guys appear, something like so. Uh, one other thing I wanted to show you before we make a bunch of duplicates of this is, you know, we have all these different forces going on here. Let's go ahead and turn on some of these show values. So I'll say show values as point trails. And I wanna see this as, uh, how about as vectors? We'll go like so. And now, once we start to unhide those, you can see the vectors that each one, oops, let's go back to our user camera. Sorry, there we go. Uh, you can see the vector that each one of these pistons is going to fly on. So that's what the math of, in this case, the turbulence is providing. Then if we turn this guy on, let's say we want them to be purple. We want this to be a vector as well. Now you can see that the green is being driven or the, the green vector, uh, the velocity that's going in this direction is being driven by turbulence and the velocity in that direction is being driven by the multiply by scalar. If we take a look at the coagulate tool, uh, let's make this like a bluish also as vectors. Now you can start to see there we go, now we have some coagulation going on. So some of these have three different forces, four or five different forces, all working together to give the effect. And as we see more and more get released, there you go. Each one of these has just a bunch of different forces. Uh, and you can see these values numerically, you can see them as vectors. Uh, oftentimes when I'm doing these ice graphs, it's really, really important to have these little things turned on so you can see exactly where your values are coming from, where your data data is coming from. And uh, there you go. So one last thing, let's go ahead and put all of this into a, uh, into a model and duplicate the model and make uh, five or six of these like we had in the original shot. And uh, I think we'll be done. So we're gonna take the point cloud, we're gonna take the emitter, the trigger sphere, and also the shaded piston, the one that's uh, actually in the scene there. And we're gonna drop all of these into this node here called dandelion model, like so. The cool thing about models in Softimage is that they can have shared namespaces. So if I want to uh, easily duplicate this, here, let me just uh, clean that up a little bit. Middle click on this guy, press Control D to duplicate it. And now I have two copies of the same model. Uh, if we go here to our original camera shot and we go back here maybe to frame one, I can kind of position this one here. Uh, we'll duplicate that guy, move this one over to here. And maybe if we take a look from the top view, uh, do another one here. I think one was close like so. Maybe we'll do one more way back here. And again, the nice thing about the models in this shared namespace is that I didn't have to go rename a bunch of objects. Uh, if I press simulate now, we get all these guys wiggling in the breeze and ooh, that gets really chunky. Again, it's uh, ice is much faster when you're not recording. So anyway, we'll just scrub through this. You can see they're spinning around waffling in the breeze, they get released. 
and then they all get ejected. I should turn off those little spinny lines, but actually that's kind of cool looking to see all the different forces working. And there you go. So that's really pretty much, uh, that's, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's very close. Again, we didn't use the, the, uh, the crazy amounts of nodes that, uh, that we had here. Now, again, they, the guys at Lot for me, they basically created a lot of their own math logic. Uh, if you look, a lot of other little subtle things going on in their effect that, uh, that I didn't do. I could have easily done them. Uh, just for time's sake, I thought I would just show you the, the kind of basics here. But anyway, there you go. That's how you would uh, create a shot like this in ice in Softimage. And yeah, so hopefully you've enjoyed this. Um, geez, thank you all for uh, letting me be your Softimage evangelist all these years. Hopefully you've enjoyed all these videos. And uh, we'll have to uh, see you on the next one. So until then, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.